Thank you for joining us for our third episode of Helping Questions. I'm Dr. Alicia Luque, Helping Questions host. In today's episode, we will have the opportunity to ask Professor Antonella Sorace our third helping question. Professor Antonella Sorace is a professor of developmental linguistics at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and founding director of the Research and Information Center Bilingualism Matters. Antonella's research on bilingualism is groundbreaking and covers a wide range of topics that go from exploring bilingual development across the lifespan to better understanding what are the linguistic and cognitive factors that facilitate bilingual language development for both children and adults. Please take a seat and stay with us as we get to hear more from Antonella about what are the trade-offs of being bilingual. Welcome Antonella to the third episode of Helping Questions and thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much, Alicia, for having me. I'm very pleased to be here. We're so excited to have you as our third guest and to be able to disentangle very important questions about bilingualism together. Considering your groundbreaking work to help us understand better both the cognitive and linguistic aspects of bilingualism, as well as your strong and inspiring commitment to make sure we all know how much bilingualism matters, we couldn't think of a better person to ask our third helping question. Should we jump right in? Yeah, let's go. Okay, fantastico. Then, Antonella, based on your experience, knowledge, and expertise, what would you say are the trade-offs of being bilingual? Right, that's a, that's an interesting question, right? That can be interpreted in many different ways. So um, I'd like to start by saying that uh, we are at a lucky time where the old misconceptions about bilingualism are still there. They haven't disappeared. But there are some new misconceptions that are arising um, due to, uh, I would say, misinterpretation of some of the current research on the bilingual advantage. Uh, so this advantage is uh, narrowly interpreted as concerning only some aspects of cognitive control of attention in isolation from other variables, for example. Um, and it's clear that these benefits exist, right? Uh, but they're not found in all cases and all contexts. I mean, this is a part of the so-called replicability crisis, right? Which doesn't affect only our research, but it affects res experimental research research in general. And it's also clear that these benefits are not restricted to bilingualism and the bilingual experience. So this has led many people uh, either to overemphasize you know, these benefits uh, without considering anything else, or uh, to doubting the import or even the existence of these benefits. And more widely, I'm afraid, the benefits of knowing more than one language. So this is totally wrong, I would like to say, because the benefits do exist, right? Um, but the whole field and people in general are becoming more aware of the many facets of the bilingual experience, right? And the fact that uh, 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 different factors involved in bilingual bilingualism affect each other. So cognitive factors, linguistic factors, social factors, educational factors, all these factors affect each other in a way that uh, we as researchers are still actively exploring. Um, so, for example, language distance is a factor that for me as a linguist is very, very interesting and very relevant. And it's only now beginning to be explored in a serious way. So it seems that, you know, from the few studies that are emerging, that uh, the more similar, typologically similar the two languages are, uh, the more cognitive effort might be involved. And so the more likely, you know, that we are to see these, uh, these cognitive effects of bilingualism. Um, so it's also clear, uh, it seems to me, we have to remember that uh, uh, cognitive control, for example, involves many different aspects. And sometimes uh, an advantage with respect to one of these components involves a disadvantage in terms of another component. So these are, you know, this is a real trade-off if you want to use this term. Uh, so we are we are still in a way of in a way exploring um, uh, what the ideal balance would be uh, between these different components uh, and the type of bilingual experience that leads to the ideal balance, right? But there is a lot more variation and a lot more complexity than we thought uh, at the beginning. 
So um, I would like also to say, and this is very important, that many of the much research, uh, including my own, I'm as, as guilty as anybody else, uh, but uh, much research is based on a comparison between bilinguals and monolinguals. And I think, you know, we really should discontinue the use of monolinguals as the point of reference, because, well, first of all, real monolinguals are becoming rarer and rarer, right? Um, and uh, even, I mean, we have research that is discovering neurological effects of passive exposure to uh, bilingual and multilingual communities. So we really, I think, the practice of comparing bilinguals with monolinguals bilinguals uh, is not good anymore. We should really compare bilinguals with bilinguals along a continuum defined by different kinds of bilingual experiences. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is um, uh, how, uh, you know, we should value bilingualism in any languages in a way that goes beyond cognitive effects. Okay, um, so uh, I mean, I'm saying probably very obvious things, but uh, bilingualism and multilingualism involves multiculturalism as well. There is a culture behind every language, there is a culture. Um, and uh, being bilingual encourages cultural awareness as well. Um, and this is a very good reason why promoting bilingualism and multilingualism means uh, maintaining linguistic diversity. And we know that linguistic diversity is really under threat. We know that of the, 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 the we, no, nobody knows about, you know, 7,000 languages existing in the world. Uh, only a handful are used by half of the world's populations. That means that almost all languages are in a situation of bilingualism or multilingualism with the majority language. So we should really understand how bilingualism works, you know, to encourage the maintenance of these languages. In the very long run, we may not be able to, to stop the trend, but at least we can slow it down. And I think, you know, that would be a good uh, result already. And the, the third point I want to make is, uh, is really the, um, the, we need a cross-disciplinary effort to encourage and maintain multilingualism, multiculturalism in any languages. And in this respect, we know that positive attitudes matter. They matter a lot more than we thought. Uh, for example, we know that parental attitudes influence children's attitudes, right? Um, but also policymakers' attitudes influence uh, policies about, about languages. And attitudes are really, really important for the maintenance of all languages, including minority languages, because attitudes affect uh, how languages, the process of passing on one language from one generation to the next. And that's the only way of ensuring that these languages survive and thrive. Um, so what, what matters, one of the factors that matters in this respect is understanding that uh, 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 live, uh, uh, all living languages um, change um, when they are in contact with one another. So languages in, in contact with one another affect each other in both directions. And this happens in the same brain, in the brain of individual speakers, but also in bilingual and multilingual societies. So expecting a language to stay and remain the same and be spoken in the same way as it used to be spoken by um, our grandparents is not a good way of helping minority languages because minority languages, when they are alive, they actually change. And, uh, and not understanding this factor, this kind of purism, if you want, can have negative effects on young people. And if young people don't want to speak the language, they won't pass it on to their children. And that's it for the language and for many languages, I'm afraid. So being able to understand that, you know, uh, uh, languages affect each other in predictable ways, in selective ways, uh, is crucial to understand that, uh, uh, to maintain bilingualism in, in all languages. So I think, you know, we have to make a real effort um, to, uh, to collaborate not only um, 
uh, collaborate between researchers and society, which is something that you know we we are doing. We are trying to do as as best as we can um, because we learn from each other. So uh, researchers learn from society and vice versa. But also, uh, we should really encourage communication among researchers and do more interdisciplinary efforts to uh, understand the, the complexity of bilingualism and encourage people to be bilingual and multilingual uh, in the best possible way. Antonella, thank you so much for your very insightful answer and all the different points you've made to help us better understand the, the, the bilingual experience, but also to help us kind of like continue carving the path to, you know, like understand better, you know, the intrinsic nature of bilingualism and, and also help us understand how we can continue moving forward to embrace and protect and promote linguistic diversity. And, you know, I think ultimately um, make our world a better place. And it was an absolute pleasure to have you. And thank you so much for your incredibly commitment to advocacy and your incredible research you are definitely really inspirational to all of us and thank you so much and happy holidays thank you so much happy holidays to you too we really hope you enjoyed our third helping question and that antonella's fascinating scientific insight and professional experience helped you to better understand what are the trade-offs of being bilingual stay tuned for our fourth episode coming to you on april 15th where we will get to ask Professor Yubin Abutalevi, Professor of Neuropsychology and Director of the Center for Psycholinguistics and Neurolinguistics at the University Vita Salute San Raffaele, Milano, Italy, our fourth helping question. What is unique about the bilingual brain? We look forward to seeing you all back here on April 15th. Also, don't forget to subscribe and to share with us your thoughts, feedback, and comments on any of our social media channels. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to seeing you all back here on April 15th. Bye.